like to bring up our first group of panelists, all professors, all leaders, authors, and custodians of our collective history. Dr. Maura Maura Toro, can you come up? Professora Marisa Licea. And Professor Jose Lopez. Jose Lopez is our community's professor. He is constantly teaching, inspiring, and making sure that we are all working together. I leave you now with the panel. located two hours south of Chicago, central Illinois, um, and we have a vibrant community of students that many of them, uh, former students of um, Jose, who come to ISU, and so well, I'm delighted to be moderating this panel. Um, I want to clarify that I am the moderator, but that the two amazing intellectuals to my right um, are Latino intellectuals that um, cannot be moderated, Especially <laughs> Jose, <laughs> and so <laughs> they, they cannot be moderated. <laughs> Larissa and I will take a little bit of time to get started and to frame the issues that matter to us, but you're really in the company of the Spanish people in the purest sense of the word. And so what I want to, to encourage you to do here this morning is to put your cell phones away and get ready to do some deep-seated listening. Because the, the history and the, the, the visions that will be shared with you today by Jose Lopez is something that you want to keep in your, in your, in your notes um, for years to come. Jose and Marisa together um, accrue an incredible testimonio, a cross-generational testimonio of the history of the community. Together with their writing, their lectures, and the students that they have taught um, and have contributed a great deal to the scholarship of the Puerto Rican diaspora. And so let me do three things here this morning, and, and I will take only five or seven minutes of your time. I want to offer a larger framework, historical framework, to understand uh, the amazing work that you see exhibited around you. I want to share a little bit of my work, and then I want to introduce you to my colleagues to the right. And so, at the risk of outing myself in terms of my age, I started my work in the community when the area that is known today as Puerto Rican Town, or to me as Paseo Boricua, was actually known as La División. The men and women that I interviewed in the late 80s, early 90s, would refer to me to La División. And I walked La División up and down many, many, many days, weeks, um, it, had just, it was a community that had suffered what Michael Rodriguez Muñiz, a sociologist here from the community, called a moment of disruption. There was a riot that um, he writes about in a, in a volume um, of the Centro Journal, where our work is published. And he, Michael Rodriguez Muñiz writes, the riot was, as scholars and activists have long argued, a transformative agent, or a, a transformative event. They forced previously on willing and on concerned authorities, from the head of police to the mayor, to acknowledge the presence and needs of the Puerto Rican population, a population that had been largely invisible and without a part in the city, end of quote. Michael adds, he conceptualizes the, this moment in the community as an interruption. It, it inaugurated a sense of the possible he called it subjectification, a body or a capacity for enunciation not previous, previously identifiable within a given field of experience, whose identification is, is part of reconfiguring 
right? And so it was a moment where we had a chance to reconfigure ourselves. I think that what you're being asked to do here today is part of that reconfiguration. It's another thread of that reconfiguration. It is the process of imagining Puerto Rican Chicago that becomes more widespread and community driven by a host of organizations and their leaders. I remember actually when we interviewed Billy and, and we started talking about the museum and look at where you're seated now, look at the amazing art that, that is here in the museum. And now the generations of students and members of the community and members and citizens of the state of Illinois and others that pass to Chicago who will learn about Puerto Rican culture and also imagine Puerto Rican, the Puerto Rican diaspora. This dreaming of Puerto Rican Chicago has been made possible. Um, it's a collective one, it's a personal one, it's a community-driven one, right? In, in Chicago, for example, um, this imagining of Puerto Rico has been done at the level of the street, everyday interactions between people. It is done in families, uh, not in the traditional sense of families, but the families that get reconstituted in the context of the diaspora, in the context of our transnational existence, and in the context of the multiplicity of lives that, that we have here and, and abroad. But it is the ability, but it is actually done by community organizations, and it is them who have the ability to carry out those dreams. Um, in some respect, the community leaders, and you're surrounded by them here today. My own recent work that extends beyond Chicago suggests that Puerto, Rico, Puerto Ricans imagine themselves in communities with other groups in the Latinx and Chicago communities. I, we're in the process of publishing a, a brand new book, should come out at the end of the year, with another Chicago scholar, Ibis Garcia, that extends the research from Chicago into the entire state of Illinois. And we found that in central Illinois, in southern Illinois, Puerto Ricans also imagine, Chicago, imagine Puerto Rico. Uh, and they imagine Puerto Rico in conversation with other nationalities, interestingly enough. You know. So it is done in solidarity through all of these um, uh, community groups. And interestingly enough, and I think Marisa probably will address this a little bit more, it is also work done by women, right? Women political activists. So let me move on and, and sort of begin to close my comments by, by way of introduction of my two esteemed colleagues uh, here to my right. Marisa Licea is a native daughter of Chicago. She was Chicago born and raised, but with deep roots in San Lorenzo, who has written eloquently about the transnational ties that exist due to the work of women, the work women do as members of families. To be sure, as you can read in, in her biography, um, her work spans from here to Kenya to Puerto Rico, but the work that has earned her a lot of citations is really the autoethnographic essays that she has done describing her family's experiences with housing and gentrification in the community. You actually can find this essay in the first volume of work that was done about Puerto Rican Chicago, edited by Gina Perez. It's in the Central Journal. Marisa and I share the cultural denomination as Las Chicas de Chicago. <laughs> because we are part of a generation of scholar activists that have taken our work together and we've presented at various conferences, including the Puerto Rican Study Association in Chicago. We have matured as scholars, sharing our work and placing Chicago in the larger map of the Puerto Rican diaspora. And, and I'm always in deep respect and admiration of her work. She's gonna share with you more of her autoethnographic uh, family history today. Now, Jose Lopez needs no introduction because he is a giant in our community. He belongs to a category of Puerto Rican intellectuals on his own right, right? He's, he's a meta-intellectual. We're, we're intellectuals, he's above. And by way of a, a genealogy of these intellectuals, and of course I'm from the west side of Puerto Rico, I'm from Cabo Rojo, so for me the genealogy of Puerto Rican intellectuals starts with Ramón Emeterio Betances, and so in the 19th century, we had Ramon Emeterio Betances. In the 20th century, we had Pedro Albizu Campos. And in the 21st century, we have Jose Lopez. <laughs> and I mean this. And I mean this. 
my task is to actually put him in the history of these Puerto Rican intellectuals because I have the highest admiration for Jose as a visionary, as a maestro, as a community activist, as a community leader, as a public intellectual, that every single interaction that I have with Jose, I go with nuggets, with concepts, with ideas, with ways of thinking about the world that were not accessible to me until I had that conversation for Jose. So with Jose, so I, I, I want to encourage you again to do some deep seated listening. And in keeping with the, with the, the, the theme of the conference, I recently came across the work of Ruha Benjamin. Ruha Benjamin is the director of the African American um, Studies Program at Princeton University, educated in Berkeley. And she has this quote that I want to leave with you because I think it, for me in many ways, it captures what Billy's agenda and goal is for us today. And Ruha Benjamin says, imagine and craft the worlds you cannot live without just as you dismantle the ones you cannot live within. So I invite you to all converse through these amazing um, next two presentations and ask questions and, and engage. Thank you very much. She was 22 years old when she traveled from Los Campos de Cerro Gordo, San Lorenzo to the highly industrial East Chicago, Indiana area. Today, I wish to share with you a bit about her immigration story, both because in some sense, it is an ordinary story, and yet it is also an exceptional one. I want to use her story as I explore with you the topic of our panel, reimagining the Puerto Rican community. For those of you who are children of immigrant parents that came in the 50s, her story will sound familiar. In fact, that's my intent, to bring to you perhaps what is a familiar story to remind you of the importance of remembering those who came before us, those who are still with us. While my remarks will focus on mommy's story to tell the larger story of our community and ways we might imagine and reimagine ourselves, I want to start with a statement that was made in Las Escrituras, the deed of the land that my father bought in San Lorenzo in 1952. I realize you may not be able to read this, but I like images of historical documents. This is a copy or an excerpt from Las Escrituras de la finca que compró papi. And the excerpt states this, Manuel Alicea, soltero, empleado y vecino de este pueblo, con residencia accidental en la ciudad y Chicago, estado de Indiana. Manuel Alicea from San Lorenzo with accidental residence in East Chicago, Indiana. I find this statement quite poignant. Indeed, the migration of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricanos like Papi and Mami was an accident and tragedy of history and the colonial powers that have governed our island. We know the story of all that led to the migration from Puerto Rico to the United States and the belief by both US and some Puerto Rican leaders that the problem was that there was too many Puerto Ricans on the island and that the solution was both to sterilize women and to encourage out migration. My parents and the subsequent experiences of racism and exploitation that they endured in the United States can be characterized in some sense as an accident, as something that happened to them and that resulted in much harm. But of course we know too that it wasn't an accident as decisions were deliberately made by both Puerto Rican and U.S. officials that led to people like my parents having to leave their families in Puerto Rico. As I talk to my parents, and in particular my mother, about her immigration story, I'm struck by the many ways in which her story, the stories of La Mujer Puerto Riqueña, like my mother, is, miss, is often missing from popular representations of who we are as a nation, as Puerto Ricanos, and as a community. 
For example, in a recent video celebrating Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricanos and what, what we have accomplished, as well as some of the injustices we have suffered, um, rarely are the stories really of immigrantes que se vinieron a Puerto Rico included in popular narratives. For example, in a recent video produced by Bad Bunny, in which Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricanos such as Pedro Albizo Campo, Lolita de Ron, and U.S. Puerto Ricans like Sonia Sotomayor are featured and celebrated, this video, while invoking pride in all that we have accomplished as a people, like many, have seen, like many I have seen over the years, it fails to include that ordinary story, the reality and sacrifices in the diaspora, and more specifically, of La Mujer Puerto Ricana. Of course, scholarly works such as those of Maura, Nilda, Flores Gonzalez, Gina Perez, Lilia Fernandez, and Merida do bring light to the realities of the Mujer Puerto Ricana Merigrante. And yet, popular representations of who we are as a nation sometimes fails to include this immigrant story and the diaspora, our displacement and our dislocation. While these videos highlight celebrities and highly accomplished New Yorkans, um, such as um, Antonia Pantoja and others, such as uh, Sonia Sotomayor, um, these do not necessarily always acknowledge the great migration that Puerto Ricans in the community uh, had to um, endure. To explore how we ourselves in the diaspora represent um, La Mujer Puerto Ricana, I look at some of the murals in our community. In these murals, I am struck by the fact that women are depicted as luchadoras and famous women such as Lolita Lebron as well are well represented in the public art. But what about the women such as my mother? How might we do a deeper analysis to include these women, women like my mother, in these public arts? Let me now focus on mommy's story and come back to the larger question. My mother was born on July uh, in July of 1931, at the time Puerto Rico was experiencing extreme poverty. As we know, by virtue of the Jones Act, she was born a U.S. citizen, albeit a second-class citizen. She, appear, she appeared in the U.S. 1940 census. Again, I know this is too small for you to read, but I'm starting to do genealogy research, and there's just something so empowering of uh, being able to see in documents um, traces of one's, one's family history. But by virtue of the Jones Act, she was born a U.S. citizen, again, as I said, albeit a second-class citizen. She appeared in the U.S. 1940 census at the age of eight as being literate and living with her parents and sibling. At that time, she was labeled uh, racially as Blanca, or white, um, as were her parents and her siblings. Yet when I look back at the 1910 census, again, my mother wasn't born at this time, but my grandparents, Ramon Flores and Maria Sanchez, in the 1910 census had been labeled mulatto. And yet in the 1930 census, my grandparents had been labeled white, and therefore my mother, born in 1931, also came to be defined by US officials as being white. And then when I looked at the 1950 census, mommy now again is considered de color negro o mulata. Uh, Loveman and Munoz in their article argue that the US officials chose to reclassify Puerto Ricans as white in the 1910s and 20s uh, uh, in an effort to make Boricuas more palatable, palatable to those in the US who objected to having possession of an island and granting citizenship to a people who were culturally and racially different from white U.S. Americans. It was the U.S. colonial rule of Puerto Rico that defined my mother racially and politically as not a full-fledged citizen. A little bit more about mommy. She attended up to seventh grade. She wanted to continue her education, but her parents pulled her out of school as she, was, as she, as she entered her teenage years concerned she would get interested in boys and elope and have children at an early age. 
She laments, though, that she has, was not able to continue her education. Um, she worked in Puerto Rico as, uh, in una de las primeras fábricas que vinieron a la isla. She sold tobacco, but even at a young age, she engaged in a great deal of caring work. Um, she cared for the children of her siblings. Um, uh, some of her siblings had started to immigrate in the early 1950s before her. And my mother recounts uh, very often uh, stories about how she took care of two young nephews in particular, one who was very sickly um, and who she had to really nurse back into health. As Merida uh, Rua argues in several of her publications, my mother's life story was defined by her displacement, but also the displacement of her siblings and her extended family. The departure of her siblings affected her life as she had to engage, as I said earlier, in much caring work. When mommy arrived in East Chicago, Indiana, she came to marry my father, who had immigrated two years earlier to work in the steel, steel mills of Indiana. I'm sorry the full image is not showing. Until their wedding day, she lived with extended family in an apartment right across from the steel mills, a huge contrast from Los Campos de San Lorenzo to living across the street from the steel mills of Indiana. For me, Chicago, and those of you familiar with uh, the Chicago Puerto Rican experience, this will be familiar to you. They moved to Hyde Park, then to Pilsen, and then to West Town, um, uh, to a part of the community that subsequently became gentrified, um, Wicker Park. This is an early picture of Mommy in East Chicago, Indiana, with my sister. Um, while my mother and family's reality was of displacement and constant movement in the early years of their arrival, Mommy, like many women in her generation, worked hard to create home, a sense of place and belonging. She and other women in our extended family planned family parties, outings, and holidays. Mommy also helped provide for us financially by first working in factories throughout the city and then working from home by selling Avon products and babysitting children. Women of my mother's generation sought out free or low cost health care for their families going to settlement houses and free clinics throughout the city. But health care also came in the form of seeking out espiritistas who perform healing rituals. My mother also practiced spiritualism while also going to church. She and other women in our community were the spiritual leaders. In fact, my mother was godmother to dozens of my cousins. The caring work in which she and other women in the community engaged was diverse and required a great deal of time and effort. In addition to taking care of us, she cared for relatives who immigrated from Puerto Rico and together with my dad, helped them get started in the US. For my mother, that meant constantly making room for them in our home, cooking for them, cleaning for them, and doing their laundry. Their labor and the many calderos de arroz they cooked, the pasteles they made, and the capias, or party favors they made to mark special occasions, helped create a sense of community and belonging. The migration experience of my mother was not entirely her choice, but through her actions, she showed agency. While my father was a wonderful provider and very caring, it fell on my mother to connect with people and institutions outside our home to ensure we had what we needed. She, like many in our community, were victims of racism and suffered injustices in housing, um, while uh, in housing, employment, and even the church. In Puerto Rico, mommy is racialized first as non-white, then as white, then as non-white, and here in the US enters a new racial reality that also defines her as non-white. Time doesn't permit me to share with you the struggles that my mother had to endure to create a sense of home and place for us. But I focus on these everyday tasks and work that women like my mother did in the day to day to emphasize that in these ordinary activities, my mother, our mother, and so many women in our community accomplished extraordinary things. And as we grow as a community and have beautiful institutions such as this one and others, it's important to remember, again, the day-to-day -day ways in which these women created family, created community, created home. 
This is Mommy standing in front of our house in Wicker Park. Mommy, uh, thank God, is 91, and she is living pretty much on her own in, in, our, in this house. One of the things that uh, my parents accomplished um, was that they were able to buy a house. They bought this house in 1975. Um, at the time, the community in the area was largely Puerto Rican and working, uh, working class. And of course, my parents worked really hard to be able to afford this house, which, by the way, needed a lot of work, uh, but is what, what it, it was what they could afford at the time. But one of the things that I want to highlight is that they were able to do this not only because of their hard work, but in some ways my parents' story is excep an exception, unfortunately. And I say that because part of the reason that they were able to not only buy the house, um, but also remain in the house, is because of various initiatives that they were able to take advantage of. For example, when they bought the house, initially they had to finance it through a program, uh, a financing program uh, called the FAIR Plan. Later, through Caballeros de San Juan, they were able to refinance their house and get a traditional mortgage loan. Um, in addition to that, um, unlike many other people in the community um, who were taxed out or um, um, who just couldn't afford the area, one of the reasons that my mother and my parents were able to stay in this home is because uh, the city has a tax freeze program for senior citizens. So when my dad turned 85, I'm 65, in 1996, I was able to freeze their taxes to what they paid in 1996. Otherwise, they would have been taxed out. I mentioned these programs because it's important to remember that these initiatives do make a difference in people's ability to purchase and retain their home. While the community has left and mommy misses the familiar and the family she came to know, she is very proud to be living on her own, um, and God willing, she'll be able to live there uh, for many more years. But my mother's success, uh, successful housing story is not the case for many in our community. Um, again, for the reasons that I mentioned, the uh, gentrification that has occurred in many of the communities in which we've resided. Mommy, together uh, with other women and her sister, continue to create home in a sense of place and diverse way. Here's mom in front of her trailer in Michigan. Years ago, my extended family bought land in South Haven, Michigan. They built a small home that we all share, and una casita that resembles, especially the inside of la casita, the homes in which they grew up. It even has a tin roof. My mother tells me that being outdoors and surrounded by nature reminds her of Puerto Rico and her growing up experience. In Michigan, in that casita, she and her sister host guests and cook Puerto Rican meals. They continue to create for the third and fourth generation a sense of belonging. Mommy likes to say that Puerto Rico progresó, progresó gracias a los puertorriqueños que se vinieron para acá. I recognize that this is a complicated statement my mother makes. After all, much did not improve in Puerto Rico after the migrations of hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricanos to the United States, and problems still abound. I think my mother is perhaps referring to the more immediate changes she saw when she returned for subsequent visits after she immigrated to the United States. In her visits, she began to see houses made of concrete, indoor plumbing, and later a telephone installed in her parents' home, for example. More than contemplate whether what my mother states is literally true or not, I really take this statement to mean that mom wants her story, her story of immigration and the sacrifices she made and makes to be recognized as having contributed to the betterment of her family, of her community, and of Puerto Rico, um, and that her life trajectory means something. I encourage you and invite you to research and um, study your family histories because it's in those day-to-day uh, -to -day, uh, small stories of our families that really is where our community lives. Gracias. Let me uh, sort of pause for a moment because uh, I think that I am one of the most blessed people on earth. 
what you heard from this amazing scholar really talks about who we are as a people. And these two women have really dedicated their lives to deeply researching and keeping alive our memories, but giving meaning to those memories. The memories that somehow the colonial system of Puerto Rico wanted for us not to have. And not only do they do this in Chicago, but they're keeping this by being challenged in their own family with their own students to tell a deeper history. I am also honored and humble not only to participate with them on this panel, but also to be in this space. I really want to be able to give thanks to two amazing co-conspirators in my life in Chicago, Billy Ocasio and Veronica Ocasio. Because what you see here is really the commitment, not only of two Puerto Ricans that grew up in this community, that were birthed in this community, but also a commitment of a family to building a Puerto Rican institution unlike any other in the United States. And this speaks to something that I want you to think about. As we talk about reimagining, rethinking Puerto Rican culture, what are we reimagining in the first place? What inform who we are? And so we got to take a deep dive. And in conversations in the last few months, because this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the institution that I helped to co-create with so many other people, the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. We're celebrating our 50th year this year. And we're celebrating, we initiated that with creating the oldest secondary Latino institution in the United States. There is no high school in the United States, no secondary educational experience in the United States that can claim the history of Dr. Pedro Albizu Campos High School. And so, in discussions with people about this institution, about the fact that you can sit here in the National Museum of Puerto Rican Arts and Culture, that we are just two blocks away from two amazing structures that were just proclaimed patrimony landmarks of Chicago. They become the first Puerto Rican anything to be recognized by any government in the United States as part of their cultural heritage. As we sit here and are going to open this new exhibit from Ponce and to see that in this museum five years ago, Billy Ocasio called and joined the Puerto Rican agenda in creating a process to ensure that Puerto Ricans would be able to deal with Hurricane Maria. And the Puerto Rican agenda of Chicago landed the first airplane in Puerto Rico right after that 
hurricane five years ago, and it was right here in a gala that that call was made, and within three days, we landed that plane in Puerto Rico and provided first aid and all kinds of other things to the Puerto Ricans in Chicago in five cities. As you sit here and we are going to open this amazing exhibit of hundreds of years of Puerto Rican art, the museum made a commitment to creating a real intersectionality between the Puerto Rican diaspora and Puerto Rico, not only by providing those necessities, but by creating a process that has made us enter into all kinds of relationship with major institutions in Puerto Rico, such as what you saw with the Symphony Orchestra of Puerto Rico. Think about that intersectionality. Think about this amazing exhibit by Antonio Martorell. And we open this museum with a year of Antonio Martorell in Chicago. Think about where we're at. Think about what we're doing. And then let's think about where do we start with our Puerto Rican identity. And I want you to rethink a lot of the way Puerto Rican culture has been interpreted. Our culture is a culture of resistance. It began five, a little bit over 500 years ago when the Spaniards decided that they were going to conquer the island of Puerto Rico. Name Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico provided more gold, and this is documented, in those first 20 years than Spain had ever known. And that's documented in our, the archives of Seville. And from the gold and silver, from the labor and the sweat and tears of those slaves, Spain began its colonial enterprise in the Americas and thus began the colonial enterprise of modern history, which a few years earlier had been inaugurated in Santo Domingo in Quisqueya and was immediately confronted by the resistance of an amazing woman by the name of Ana Caona. And Ana Caona is legendary in Haiti. She's legendary in the Dominican Republic and she's legendary in Puerto Rico because Tite Curet wrote a song that was made famous, Ana Caona. And what did Ana Caona establish? Ana Caona established the first maroon society in Latin America. And we got to get rid of the idea that our Latin American identity is premised on some hybridization of European creolization. The creole elites of Latin America attempted to create an idea that's false about our identities. I tell everyone, if you wanna know who a Colombian is, study the cumbia. If you wanna know who a Mexican is, study the sones. If you wanna know who a Cuban is, study the guaracha. If you wanna know who a Brazilian is, study the samba. If you want to know who an Argentinian is, study the tango. If you want to know who a Puerto Rican is, study the danza, the, I'm sorry, study the plena, the bomba, the plena, the danza, and the salsa. 
And what do they all have that ties them? African rhythms and sounds. And what I'm going to suggest to you that what makes us Puerto Rican is an incredible cultural syncretism that cannot be explained in the white-black binary that we often place the idea of racism and all of this stuff. We've got to rethink our identities and our identities are deeply rooted in those cultures of resistance that began everywhere in Latin America because the Cimarrones, where the word maroon comes from, were not just runaway slaves. They were runaway indigenous people, runaway the Jews, runaway Moors and Muslims from Spain, and even runaway Castilians and everyone else who did not fit in the colonial system. And I want you to reimagine what that means because we're Puerto Rican, because we speak Puerto Rican. A thousand words exist in Puerto Rico that almost nobody else uses. And we could do the same thing with Cubans, with Dominicans, with Mexicans. We have a language. Marisa just talked about her mother's espiritismo and her deep sense of spirituality which characterizes all of us. I don't care if you're an evangelical. I don't care if you're a Catholic. Deep down inside, you're looking at something deeper in terms of your spirituality. And those are the healing powers of that your grandmother and your great-grandmother taught you. And all of that is based on our African and indigenous Pass. Syncretized with Catholicism, but it's no longer Catholicism. I'm sorry. As a matter of fact, I'm going to suggest to you that we were just told that the Pasofinos are, and I love that they're from Puerto Rico. I beg to differ a little bit. Genetically, they are the descendants of the Arabic horses which were not Arabic, they were Moorish horses from North Africa. And epigenetically, they became Puerto Rican because of the trotting of the Pasofino. So I just want to make that as a scientific <laughs> observation. Okay. But any, <laughs> anyhow, I don't want to, I don't want to um, exclude this because this is an amazing study. I just wanted to show epigenetically that is possible. Genetically, it is impossible because there were no horses in the Americas. They had disappeared completely. Epigenetically, it is possible that they're Puerto Rican. So, that said, I would say that in Puerto Rico, we have proclaimed, we have proclaimed the three kings as Los Santos Reyes Mago. Have you ever thought about that? Where else do people call Los Reyes Mago, Los Santos Reyes Mago? Nowhere in the world. Only Puerto Ricans. Why? I'm going to tell you a little story. And the little story has to do with the Puerto Rican imagination. So when we talk about reimagining Puerto Rican culture, think about the story. And think about it from this perspective. The Puerto Rican Woodcarvers were the first major visual artists of Puerto Rico, creating an authentic Puerto Rican artwork. Those santeros were mulatos, and the problem with mulatos is that mulatos is not black and white. Mulatos is more complex in Puerto Rico and in Latin America. It includes our indigenous people. The Tainos were not wiped out from Puerto Rico. And they live in all of us. So when we think about the three wise men, the Puerto Ricans did something that only the Pope does. Only the Pope can beatify. Puerto Ricans beatify the three wise men. <laughs> I, M Mike is watching because Mike, you know, he's one of these deeply Catholic. He's trying to say, what the hell is he going with this? <laughs> okay, so anyhow, the three wise men. 
the three wise men, the Spaniards, brought all these saints from Spain and they needed to represent them in the churches. But they couldn't bring those statues from Spain. They had mulatto woodcarvers create those saints. And so they became the Santeros. This mulatto, many of them with already their knowledge of wood carving, both in the Taino context and the African context, they were carving the saints. But the priest had to tell them who they were carving. So they had to tell the story of the three wise men in Puerto Rico. You will see the three wise men represented always alongside each other. Not ever one in front of the other. Alongside each other. They are never on camels. They are on Pasofino horses. <laughs> Do you know that? This has been for over 400, almost 500 years. Okay? Because we're doing an exhibit of about 300 years we go back 500 years, okay, when these were created. And so what happens? Three wise men. And they were told they represented like three races. And one of them was black, and his name was Melchor. The, the, the most venerated santo in Puerto Rico is Melchor, the black saint, the black king. And so if three Wise people are traveling together. Who leads? The one in the middle. Right? And so, here you have Melchor in the middle. Riding a white horse. You flip the script of racism. Melchor is the subject. The horse is the object. And that. Is why in the poor we can imagination the three wise men are so venerated. This speaks to exactly this cultural syncretism that makes us who we are. And one of the things you learn in maroon societies is how to navigate all kinds of things. And it's based on improvisation. That's why Puerto Rican music is so improvisational. Think about it. Everything we do, we improvise. And we do it well. Our greatest singers are the trovadores. They have to improvise a decima, a poem with one word. Imagine that. Now people talk about hip hop and about rap. Puerto Ricans were doing that hundreds of years ago. That's why Puerto Ricans helped to create rap in the Bronx, no? That is why Puerto Rican salsa is such a complex musical expression that includes a whole array of musical instrument from the guido to the cuatro to the guitar to the drums. Imagine that. And it's Improvise. What I'm trying to tell you is that in order for us to reimagine Puerto Rican culture, we must know where it is rooted. And we're not rooted in Spain. We're not rooted in Africa. We're not rooted with the Tainos. We are a mixture of mixtures that created a cultural syncretism which allows us to be very, very creative. Very creative. Just think about this little island producing some of the greatest musicians in the world. Imagine in Chicago you had a bed bunny with something like 85,000 people and Lady Gaga got 60,000. Tell you something, no? <laughs> now, this is important because we've got to be able to rethink. And I want to 
ask you to think about this word, radical curiosity. We must be informed by radical curiosity. And I'm not talking about the word we use radical nowadays. We throw it around. Radical comes from the Latin word radi, which means root. Let's look at our root. Let's envision our roots and then be able to plan for the future. And what does the future hold? Puerto Ricans in Chicago many years ago created a home place. Those pictures you saw with Maritza are not that far away from here. We were we were driven from Wicker Park, but we made a claim, as Arocho says in his poem, to Humble Park. And we did it with those flags. Those flags are now historical landmarks of Chicago. But more importantly, we just became the first, the first cultural enterprise district in the United States. Recognize, now listen to this, this is important. We were made a special, special district. You know, legislatures have the right to create special service districts. And no one had thought about creating a cultural enterprise district. And we did. Five years ago, we held a conference here, and we came up with this idea of creating cultural enterprise district. And the governor of Illinois last year signed the bill right here, making this a cultural enterprise district. And for two miles from Division and Western, La Division, Maura, to Division and Pulaski, two miles, we will have an official Puerto Rico town in the United States. The only one recognized legally by any governmental body. And this is important because I talk about maroon societies. Why it is important to have to deal with the concept of critical space and place. Why it is important for you to have a place that Bell Hooks in her works, in one of her works, Yearning, calls, she's got a chapter called Home Place. And she speaks about black domestic space as the place where blacks in the worst of times would heal from the wounds of racism. We are saying that this is our place where we will recover from the wounds of a racist colonial society that we live in. And whether people get mad with those words, that's okay. Think about it. That's what I tell my students. Don't believe anything I say. Check it out. And some of them are back there, so they can tell you. All right? Um, so, anyhow, what I wanted to just, uh, for us just to think about is this. Historically, we were informed by maroon societies, who we are spiritually in every aspect. I would even say politically, and I, I could talk about that uh, a long time, but I'm not. Um, but politically, spiritually, um, culturally, take any part of who we are, and it's fundamentally found in our maroon societies. Think about the foods we eat. Think about a sancocho or a gandinga. Think about pasteles. Think about alcapurrias, which by the way are, is an Arabic word. Think about maharete, which also is an Arabic word. And you will find this cultural syncretism that makes us who we are. And we need to celebrate that. But more importantly, we need to reinvigorate it in such a way that we can recreate 
and reimagine our Puerto Ricanness in the context of a society that has left us out and continues to leave us out. Because I just want you to know that if you listen carefully to what Marisa said, the U.S. colonial enterprise had a real problem with making Puerto Rican citizens. And by the way, we are legally ruled under a doctrine unequal, separate, but unequal. That's the doctrine of the insular cases and the organic acts. We were never made to be full-fledged citizens. And as Maritza's presentation so well tells us, when you see the story of her mother and father, what we had to go through in order just to eke out our existence here. Even in the Catholic churches, our masses were not held in the sanctuary because those sanctuaries belonged to the white ethnic group that founded the church. We were sent to the basement and to the social centers of the church. So, as we reimagine and rethink where we're going, we are in an incredible process of recreating, literally, our own maroon society right here in the heart of Chicago. And yesterday, we had the visit of the president of the University of Illinois, the three chancellors from the University of Illinois. And as we walked down Division Street, this is exactly the message I sent them. But more importantly is that we have something to offer to the greater world. That we're not here as an isolate. That we're here because we can be an example. Really a shining star for all people who are oppressed. Because that's what Marunich speaks to for, since its inception. So I want you to think about this as we travel on this journey this, um, the next two days. As we think about where we're going. But I want you to really deep, deep and think about something that a few years ago an urbanologist by the name of Mike Davis spoke, wrote a book called Magical Urbanism. And it's how Latino are impacting the um, development of cities. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that we can definitely be the next shining light for possibilities in terms of what it means to be a cultural enterprise district in which culture infuses everything because that's how maroon societies were created and it's the motor of our own human progress without ever, ever thinking that we're better than anyone else, that we deserve more than anyone else, because if there's one thing that informed maroon societies, it was that sense of solidarity. And we will be forever in solidarity with all those who are oppressed and colonized within the realm of US power structure. I am really thankful for this opportunity. I want you to think about a concept, a word that Du Bois developed in explaining and talking about the African American experience and it's called the veil. Think about what a veil does. It hides but it's also a way of camouflaging. And sometimes in order to survive, we have to camouflage. And the history of maroon societies is also a history 
of camouflage. I want you to think about a legal term called the concept of cultural citizenship. Latinos have added a new dimension to U.S. constitutional law, and that is cultural citizenship. And that's where we lay claim to our spaces to redefine and define who we are. Thank you very much, and I hope I've added some elements. Let me, um, yes, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Maura, Dr. Alicea, and Dr. Jose Lopez. Thank you.